Our speaker this evening, Darren Murphy, RN, MPH, has been designing and presenting workshops and seminars on all things to do with interpersonal communication since 1997. His programs have taken him all over the U.S., Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. This past November, he was booked by the Department of Homeland Security for his workshop on public speaking, and he just returned a few days ago, actually, from one of his workshops in the Ukraine on how to deliver, how to deliver the bad news to patients and families or doctors and staff in the Ukraine. Um, and following that talk, has been asked to return. This past year, after taking course on creative thinking from Gerard Puccio, am I saying his name correctly, PhD at Buffalo State University, Darren designed a workshop on creative thinking with critical analysis. Darren agrees with Dr. Puccio in firmly believing that critical thinking is a 21st century essential skill. As Einstein says, we can't solve today's problems with yesterday's thinking. Darren's book, Eight Keys to Connecting, The Communication Code of Conduct, gives the specific skills and strategies of all great communicators. He believes the art of conversation and relationship building is being lost due to electronic devices and their addictive properties. Darren's talk this evening will touch on the need for great communicators as well as creative thinkers and his belief that the world, our country, and all families are desperately in need of both. Please welcome Darren Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And thank you, National Catholic Business Women's League. When I was first offered this opportunity to speak with you, your title really impressed me, and this is the reason why. In your title, you keep the word Catholic. In our society, our culture today, which is very secular, very relativistic, and they shun anything Christian, especially Catholic, you keep the word Catholic in your title. That's brave. Secondly, you keep the word business in your title. When the self-appointed intelligentsia think that socialism is the answer, which is, socialism is really a euphemism for communism, you keep the word business in your organization's title, which is a very intelligent thing to do. One of the most intelligent women of the 20th century, Margaret Thatcher, said this about socialism. It's okay until you run out of other people's money. <laughs> so true. But you keep that in. You're Catholic. Your business, which points towards capitalism. But you leave something out that you really are also. You're generous. Not one, not two, but three young girls get the benefits of this organization by being put through the Catholic high schools here in Nashville. Not only are they going to get a good education, they won't be confused about bathrooms, and they'll be <laughs> safe. So to come and ask, to be asked to speak to this organization when I say thank you, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, because you are brave, you're intelligent, and you're generous. I really feel it as an honor to come and speak with you. So, with that in mind, I didn't want to just come and promote my book and give you a little talk. I come bearing gifts. <laughs> the first gift is from the Acton Institute. The Acton Institute takes their name after Lord Acton. Lord Acton, who coined the phrase, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He was a fine proponent of capitalism and the free market. The Acton Institute is at the Bush School of Economics, nothing to do with George or George, but this is at the Catholic University. And the School of Economics is a very, it's a big think tank. And Acton Institute shares the his history of capitalism, how it's helped so many people in present day. It really promotes entrepreneurship. I called up the Acton Institute and told them who I was going to talk to, and I said, what do you think about that? The National Catholic Business Women's League. Wouldn't you like to do something for them? 
They sent 30 copies of their latest book, Foundations of a Free and Virtuous Society. This is for you ladies. Let's come up to the table again. Out. How many, does anyone here own horses? No. So you're not up at 4 o'clock in the morning like I am. Anyways, they have a program on EWTN, which is one of my most favorite um, shows. And at 4.30 every Monday morning, the Acton Institute puts on a half-hour program. And they show, uh, showcase a present day or recent historical entrepreneur and tells all the behind the scenes stories. And then at the end of the program, they make a case for capitalism and how it works and how it really helps other people. Which brings me to my next thing that I've brought for you. I brought you copies of the Cardinal Menzenzi Report. Cardinal Menzenzi Foundation is a really, it's a, it's a Catholic organization. I've been a member of them for a few years now. And they have this one article that I brought to you, and it compares communism with capitalism. And we are in a culture that is forgetting what communism has done in the past. And we need to be reminded about their history their legacy, their present-day effects on people, because it's creeping into our society. And you ladies, being business ladies, know what that means. So I, they sent me, for you, copies of this article that you can share with people. It's not theory, it's not conjecture, it's just history. And the final thing I bring to you are these little blue-wrapped cups this, this this is the most neatest thing. I did. Well, they're all neat things, but this is really cool. I went to Mary Coleman, who is the manager of the St. Thomas Credit Union. I said, Mary, you know, I've been a member of the credit union now for about eight years, and I have gotten so many benefits. They, they have first mortgages, second mortgages, they have lower rates, no fees or less fees. Everything, all the profits get plowed back into the credit union so that they can do things for their members. Well, Mary has figured out a way, because a lot of you are business owners, and even if you aren't business owners, if you're corporate ladies, it doesn't matter. They have, uh, she has figured out, under the auspices of the Nashville Catholic Business Women's League, everyone here, any of your employees and all of your family members can become members of the St. Thomas Credit Union. And that is a really big benefit. Up here on this table, when you come and get your cup, get this, and this lists all the benefits of being a member of the St. Thomas Credit Union. They are presently joining this co-op of banks, credit unions really, where they are going to be offering 30,000 ATMs across the country. So if you're a member, you can still access your money, you can do anything. And it, it's all here in much detail. Give it some thought because if you provide this benefit for your employees or your families yourself, it truly is and it costs that much. So those are the gifts that I brought for you today. And I hope you, you really enjoy them and get the most benefit out of them. Now, to what I, what I promote, my book, A Keys to Connecting. I thought I'd do a fun thing instead of just give a talk about the book itself, and hopefully I do want to sell some, hopefully sell some, but what I thought we'd do is one chapter out of the book, and it's about understanding communication. More importantly, understanding those people that just make you want to pull your hair out. Those ones that are just unbelievable. Keep you up at night thinking about why doesn't that person go someplace else to get a job? Anything. Those people that just drive you crazy. It's under the four universal personality styles in the book. And what's really neat about this, you guys already know this, but now you're going to learn how to apply this knowledge in a very concerted way. So we're going to go to the four universal personality styles. This is cross-gender, cross-cultural, cross-country. 
There is no monopoly on this. Everybody has this. So, it, we're going to do a quadrant, a personality style, a director, a personality style of a director, just by virtue of the name, is his or her office door open or closed? Closed. Closed, absolutely. Do you have to make an appointment with the director? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And if you were going to have 10 minutes with that director and you were going to run over because that director was asking you some very pertinent questions, what would be a wise thing to do? You think it would be wise to say, gee, we're going to run over because you've been asking some really good questions. That means you're interested in what I'm presenting. Should I continue with the presentation or should I reschedule? All of a sudden, that director-type personality thinks, this is one smart person, because you have put the direction back in his or her lap. And people like people who are like themselves. And when you do something like that to a director-type personality, they think, you are one smart cookie. As opposed to... The relator, the one that wants to make sure everybody's needs are met, that everything is relational, is his or her door open or closed? Oh. Absolutely. You have to make an appointment? No. no. What's on every relator's desk or side table? Candy. Candy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else? Business cards. Tissues. Photos. Absolutely. <laughs> Tissues. And believe me, that's usually the very, because I really continue to ask, they'll say pictures and, and uh, drawings from your kids, their kids, if it's a small enough company. And I keep on wanting, because it's tissues, because it's for those times. They're a relator. And if you want to know which one you're like, which one of these drives you crazy? Because you're the, the opposite. The this one. Socializer. Door open or closed? Open. Is she there or he? No. Where are they? Socializing. Right. And who are they talking about? Everyone themselves where they've been, where they're going, and aren't you sorry you're not with me? <laughs> Big time socializer, as opposed to the thinker. Door open or closed? Close. Absolutely. Data, data, data. They process it, they analyze it, what do they want next? More data more data. You want something done right? Give it to a thinker. You want it done on time? Think again. <laughs> when you break down all your relationships and you start putting a face to these type archetypes, then you start realizing this person drives me crazy because they're always talking about touchy-feely stuff. And and I'm thinking about the bottom line so that everybody can have a home. They're talking about how are we doing right now. Now, I'm not going to say who are you on this because everyone here sees themselves as a director when it's called for. Sees themselves as a socializer when it's called for, don't you? And a relator when it's called for and a thinker. And that's all true, and that's how we can get along. However, when we're sick, tired, angry, afraid, or stressed out, we have a dominant style that we go to that has successfully got us to this point today safely. And the more that you're sick, tired, angry, or afraid, and unaware of your dominant style, 
You just keep on going, 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 and then you don't even get along with your own kind. Out here is where they start to talk institutionalization. So when you're sick, tired, angry, or afraid, or stressed out, and you're aware of this, then you're able to say, hey, take a time out. Count to ten. Question. Out of these four, what is my dominant style? Relator. Anybody else? Social. Social. Socializer. Director. Thinker. Director. That acting class helped me immensely. <laughs> I am a director. I'm Irish, Catholic, and a Yankee. <laughs> and then I went to parochial school. <laughs> when I went into the military, I breezed through. It was just like home. It was just like school. And that was a benefit. It truly, truly was. Because back in 1970, kids are doing everything to get out of the military. They were scared to death. I was scared to death also. But I learned from my upbringing. But if the whole world was like this, what would it be like? Oh, it would be terrible. If the whole world were any one of those four, it would be terrible. When, hey, this is, this is a kind of a neat thing that I like to do. CEO of a company, you just bought another company. You want to get the two companies together. You, bring, you think of a bright idea. I went to Darren's seminar, and I know that I should pick a thinker and a socializer to plan a company-wide picnic. What kind of picnic are you going to have? Some of you say you might not have one. <laughs> I know. This is one of those times where both parties could be right. If this one and this one don't understand how the other one acts and why and the perspective that they look at things, there probably won't be a pick. But if this one and this one truly understands and evaluates and looks at people and tries to make them be understood by me first, as opposed to, in all communication, we want to be understood. But when you reverse it and you say, I want to understand you first, and then we'll get to me. When they look at that and they understand that, that's when you have the best whatever you plan entirely. The socializer will say, hey, look, we're going to have a band. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll have a rock and roll band, and there'll be music, and everybody will love it. And the thinker will say, we need some, we've got to check the weather, we need some protection, we need electricity. And the socializer that understands the thinker say, yeah, 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 you take care of that. Talking about a band, we could have a stand-up comic. Yeah, people don't want to listen to music all the time. Yeah, we'll have a stand-up comic. And the thinker will say, are kids going to be coming in? What are the age groups? And we, if it's a family affair, we need clean comedy. Yeah, 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 you take care of that. Kids, yes, pony rides. Yeah, we got to have pony rides. And the thinker will say, what are the demographics? What is the age groups? You see, we have all four. And we respect and understand the other party, especially the one that keeps us up at night, drives us crazy. Then you will have the best of whatever company family life. And it was pointed out to me last week, I was in Ukraine teaching recently graduated doctors and last year medical students how to give bad news to patients and family. And it wasn't, what was really neat about this, this was a request from the newly graduated doctors and the last year students. It wasn't from the university down, it's something that they said we need this. But what was pointed out, and I teach this, was one of the gentlemen pointed out, you know what? When you get married, you usually pick the opposite of you because that person you feel subconsciously fulfills what you don't have. Isn't that neat? Now the problem comes up is if you don't understand that. And that's when you start having your problems, and it usually starts within six months, if not a year. 
But the people that are really aware of this, you have something that I don't have. The two of us together can do anything. Everybody, fold your arms. <clears throat> Didn't even think about it. Now, I want you to do it the exact opposite way. Opposite. Don't want to do it, do you? And those of you that did do it, what do you want to do? You want to go back. And this is true of our personal relationships. We kind of hang out with those that are just like us. And that really narrows your, your, your perspective, your life, everything else. In my book, I, this is one whole chapter in these four universal personality styles. Because if we understand how the other person thinks, especially the ones that keep us up at night, then all of a sudden it isn't such a tantamount, all crucible, end all situation. There is, in my book, I talk about the herd of one, and who I'm referring to are the sociopaths, the people that have no emotion, have no feelings, and don't care about you no matter what. And there are that group of people. You should be aware of that. But the majority of us are one of these. Now, the reason why I wrote this book, I've been doing these workshops and seminars and all things to do with communication since 1997. And from 97 till about 2005, I saw a great drop down in the ability of people to communicate. And every one of us have gone to restaurants and seen a whole family and everyone's on this. Facebook is coming out with an app for four-year-olds. I call electronic devices the nicotine of the 21st century. It is doing some phenomenal things to our brain that we wouldn't want to be done. It is stopping neural pathway development. Because guess what? When you're being entertained, it ain't developing nothing. You're just being entertained. And they've done a lot of functional MRI studies. It is addictive in a very profound way. And people don't even realize it. You've seen them texting while driving. I saw a lady coming down the street the other day, and she was going like 15 miles an hour. She thought she was being safe. She was texting at 15 miles an hour. I saw uh, in the garage at the uh, ambulatory surgery center that I work at, one lady was texting, and she was taking a turn, and she went over the curb, and she was stuck. They had to get a tow truck to get the car up off the curb in the garage. The book's purpose is to really go back to the fundamentals. I didn't give an exhaustive treatise on anything. I gave a broad overview. No one reads thick books anymore, except me. <laughs> I love James Michener, and some of you might not. Who's James? The Young Table. Who's James Michener? <laughs> he wrote books like that. <laughs> but you know, James Michener wrote a book called The Novel, and was about the writing industry. You know how thick it was. <laughs> Getting back to my book, what I've done is I've outlined eight essential keys to communication. As Father pointed out. The majority of communication is nonverbal. It's actually 55%. And they came up with that number of Dr. Albert Moravian, who first was an engineer, then he went back to school and he got a PhD in psychology. Engineer, data, data, data. Psychology, he emphasized and studied communication. And they actually, he actually got people, reams of data, watching TV with the sound off. What do they say? or the sound on, but no visual. What are they doing? What's, what's the anger conflict, uh, if any? And he was able to come up with the impact of your communication, 55%, is just how you look, just how you walk into a room. Are you moving like, hi, I'm the motivator. <laughs> 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 I love doing that. Fifty-five percent is just how you look. And do you want to be here? And I had a problem. I got real good. Remember, Irish Catholic Yankee, breeze through basic training. You know what my my default facial expression was? 
It got me through life very safely with the nuns, the brothers, my mother and father. But later on, I saw these people that would smile and people just gravitated to them. What's going on? When I went to Chicago to learn how to do public speaking, they told, I, I said to them, you know, I need to get better at this. Um, what do you suggest I do? And I said, you need to go back and join two Toastmasters clubs and get a coach. And I did get a coach, and some of you might know her. She's here in Nashville. She coached beauty pageant winners, Tina Van Horn. And I hired her to coach me. And she said, all right, tell me something. And within two minutes, she said, shut up. Shut up. She said, we're not at a funeral, Darren. It was because of this, that 55%. That 38% is the, the tone, the inflection, the speed, the modulation of your voice. And then finally, it's the 7%, the actual content. So people look at you, make a decision, listen, make a decision, and then they'll start processing words. The whole key to that book, the overall thing, is for everyone to try to understand the other person first. See, we all want to, we all want, I want you to understand me, every one of us. And if every one of us is doing that, how much understanding is going to really happen? Not too much. Stephen Covey made this one of his seven habits of highly effective people. Seek first to understand, then be understood. This and the other keys in that book is all about understanding the other person first. And then, no matter what is called for in your everyday socializations, be it with spouse, children, business people, it's not going to matter to you. Because you're going to understand the world is better with everybody. Thank you very much. On sale tonight, one third off, ten dollars a copy. Graduation's coming up, ladies. Good graduation <laughs> gift. But do come up and get your free gifts. And I have some flyers here on the workshops and seminars that I offer. And the latest one that I just designed after taking that creative thinking work um, course through Buffalo State University on creative thinking. I would like it if you would take that and look at it because those of you that own your business or want to bring new ideas into the corporation that you're already working at, it would be pretty darn phenomenal. Uh, one of the main business writers in the whole world, Jim Collins, good to great, great by choice, every company that he has studied has a creative thinking component in it. Thank you very much. After that, when I got out of the military, I bummed around the country. I ran out of money in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I'm originally from Massachusetts. And I went to work at a hospital. And I saw what the nurses was doing, and I thought that was pretty darn cool. Now, I became an RN back in 1985. Do you know how many male RNs there were back then? Not too many. I was starting to learn about communication. And when I went on the floor, you know, after I graduated, I'm, I'm going to be working. I went around to the lady that was running the floor, not always the nurse manager, the de facto manager. And I said, <laughs> please, if you see me doing anything and it's not right, stop me from killing anybody. <laughs> I also made the ward clerk, who really runs every floor, my best friend. Any other questions? Oh, yes, yes. Nursing is a vocation. And it's, yes, it's predominantly female, but there are a lot of fine male nurses, and we are, we are called to nursing. I presently work in an ambulatory surgery center. I did 25 years in emergency rooms. I don't think anybody should stay over five years. <laughs> Mental health. Everybody starts looking bad to you. In uh, the past uh, nine years, I've been in an ambulatory surgery center. Yes? I you said about uh, seeking to understand before being understood. What if you think you understand, but you don't agree? Oh, 
Disagreement is fine. But what you will start with is what do we agree on first? See, people will make mountains over, out of molehills on disagreements. So when you, in, I teach negotiation. <laughs> okay, let's put that to one side. What do we agree with? What do we have in common? And then I, you emphasize that. In fact, what happens when you do turn that around and say, okay, let's discuss this later. Let's see what we have in common. A thing called psychological reciprocity happens. And that other person that you disagree with, because they now start seeing what you do feel in common and agree with, you're pretty good. And then all of a sudden they want to understand you and why you disagree with that in a very open way. Psychological reciprocity. Anybody else? Do you think that we are all one? Or do we all have a little bit of everybody? We operate when it's called for. This comes into play when we're sick, tired, angry, afraid, or stressed out. That's when we go to where we have, really have successfully reached today alive. And that's when it comes out. And when do you have problems with people? When they're sick, tired, angry, afraid, or stressed out. And that's when this comes in. It's such a good tool. I, I look at people. Uh, I, I'll get patients. Uh, I work in recovery room. Patient, 99% of the time, is still asleep. The people bringing the patient to me <coughs> invariably will say, or mom or dad controlling. Oh, high maintenance, all of this. And what I do to combat that, by the way, we, we talk to ourselves at 600, 1200 words a minute, and that colors our whole perception. So when I'm getting this information in, I combat it with this. Gee, this patient doesn't even have their underwear on. They got a stupid gown on. They don't come here every day like I do. They're totally at the mercy of strangers and We've been sticking very sharp objects in them. I think I'd be a little bit strange myself. And mom and dad, or husband or wife, up in that room, waiting room, hasn't been told anything. And if this is their loved one, they're going to be a little bit different also. One of the ambulatory surgery centers uh, once came up with the idea, let's do discharge instructions while the patient's still in surgery. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. They're not going to process any information until they see that patient breathing, talking, normal. And so when you get to be my age, 66, they leave you alone. <laughs> A year later, when their infection rate had gone up, and it's not the place I work at now, they said, oh, we're not giving the discharge instructions correctly. No, what it was, they were doing it when they weren't processing it. Any other questions? We still have the best health care in the whole world. People come from all over the world for us. And that's really something. I did, I just returned from Ukraine and I taught that workshop at the uh, Vado Friend Keist. University. It's an international university. There were students from Africa, Poland, Ukraine, uh, in various European countries, and they come there. What's really neat about this university, it's not so that that doctor will then go to the United States. They're going back to their own countries. I had 22 different nationalities. English was their second language, so there was no problem in the classes. Every single one of those doctors wanted to go home to help make their country better. But they sent to America to get the highest standard of care. Isn't that neat? Mm -hmm. That they had that awareness, their, that humility. The best care is there. Let's get taught by them. 22 countries. You know, we think of that song, uh, We Are the World, as being sappy. Well, at the end of the 10 days, and I had the big celebration, we were all going home, and there was 22 countries with their individual flags waving them, singing We Are the World. And I'm standing there, the director crying. <laughs> 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 we are the world. 
because it was so profoundly moving and, and the, the truth of it was just, I mean, they really felt that way. Isn't that neat? Yeah,